Hi, I'm Graham Trudeau, and I still don't know if I should refer to myself as Symphoneers in these intros. This is what I'm doing for the set review this go-around. A kind of random selection of cards that I think are interesting, worth building around, or maybe being misvalued or misassessed, like over-underrated by other people. Uh, for reference, this will mostly be from a standard standpoint, as that's what I'm most competitive in, like regularly hitting numbered mythic and stuff. Um, there will be some nods to casual play or other formats, but those will not be the focus of the video. Uh, yeah, with that stuff out of the way, let's get into it. Whew, we had to start with the adversaries. Absolute talk of the town. Um, so I just think the adversaries... I'm, I'm excited for the adversaries, personally. They're just strong, powerful creatures, flexible creatures. Creatures that don't get blown out by counter spells, which is always, you know, solid. Um, to arbitrarily rate them. Um, and this is not a very firm rating, I just kind of picked a thing. Uh, number one, we have Bloodthirsty Adversary. Bloodthirsty Adversary is just... E even though I don't know it's the most single-handedly powerful adversary, it gets the number one just because it's the most versatile adversary. Um, in particular, like, it can go in aggro and recur burn spells, it can go in control and recur card draw or whatever, chump block, etc. Like, there is a wide range of decks that Bloodthirsty Adversary fits into, so I think that's... it will maybe be the one that sees the most play. It's a little hard to predict, but you know. Uh, number two, Primal Adversary. It gets the number two spot just because I think it's the adversary that single-handedly has the potential to win the most games. Uh, specifically, after a control opponent board wipes, Primal Adversary for seven will you have nine mana out or something like that. Uh, just huge instant threat, like army in a can, you can win the game that turn type of thing. Very solid. Uh, the fact that it animates lands too, very relevant for blanking a decent amount of removal, although depending on what removal is standard in the new standard, might not be super relevant, but yeah, just the adversary that I think has the most potential to kind of win games out of nowhere. Number three, Intrepid Adversary. Just another really good card in mono white. Doesn't, uh, doesn't cost three mana, so yay! Uh, in the number four slot, Tainted Adversary. This is the number one adversary in my heart. Uh, just a pile of zombies stapled to a card. Very good with um, Champion of the Perished. Might might not get there. Uh, I think it's one of the best cards, or like it will be the best card in black aggro decks, so that's something. Whether or not like zombies or some other shell gets there. I think an interesting potential, or like an option to use the card that people might overlook is in combination with First Day of Class. A uh, First Day of Class, if you're unfamiliar, gives creatures plus one plus one and haste, or like subsequently cast creatures. So if you do that and then play a Tainted Adversary kicked for even just like five or, hmm, yeah, five, seven, uh, that can do a kind of Primal Adversary thing, even more so because you're getting twice as many zombies. They only last the turn, but if you're hitting for, you know, 15 damage or whatever, you probably only need that turn. So Tainted Adversary, lovely lad, but yeah, no, hmm, might, might be a little more on the jankier side of things, we'll see. Uh, Spectral Adversary in the number 5 slot, also, like, I, if I didn't hit it at the top, all these cards are really strong, I think they'll all see play. Spectral Adversary is, I think, the narrowest. Um, it can go in spirits, it can go in kind of tempo decks, control decks. Uh, it can do some kind of interesting parlor tricks of, like, phasing out your, opponent, uh, your opponent's paladin class and making their combat math all wonky all of a sudden, uh, favorable for you. Uh, or it can just, like, buy time while your tempo deck works. I think it's a very good spirit, good card but kind of the least overall exciting of the cycle. Next up, we have Disturb. Uh, I think people might be overlooking Disturb a little bit. I don't know that it will be amazing, but I think Disturb presents an interesting angle to build out Azorius shells, in particular some with in combination with some cards that have kind of been floundering so far, like Monk class. Uh, Denic, I think, is an important part of that shell. Just a 2-3 card that protects your graveyard. There will probably be significant graveyard hate in the new format. Not necessarily like Tormod's Crypt, you know, exile the entire graveyard, 
but a lot of good cards have incidental graveyard hate stapled onto them in Innistrad, so being able to protect your Disturb spells will be pretty important in any deck built around playing Disturb. Uh, the Pies Apparition half of Denic too, just a good value generator, like, ooh, look at that good spirit. Faithful Mending is the other part of this shell I wanted to outline. Or, like, it's something I feel like people might forget in combination with Disturb creatures. Uh, you can, you know, chuck them into the bin, protect them with Denic, cast them at your leisure. Um, I think the the overall deck will be more coherent than people immediately realize. So even if, like, I'm missing the shot or, like, you know, off base on some of these cards, I think it's a general archetype to remember exists. Uh, next up, we have Weird Budget Black Cards. Or I think Black Aggro is something that we'll be getting a lot of help with in Estrad, thankfully. Um, Graveyard Trespasser I like mainly just because it's kind of a cheaper Westgate Regent effect, the Ward Discard card. Um, I also like it v in combination with Haste effects, which we'll get to later. But ETB, drain the opponent, attack, drain the opponent. You have something that's dealing 5 damage, the turn it comes down healing for 2. Uh, if you're hasting it in, which is lovely. Even if you're not doing that, it's just a nice, efficient body in a kind of color that has been missing that for a while. Uh, Vengeful Strangler and Eaten Alive I wanted to showcase just because they're a very important part of a deck I run into more than I would like. Uh, the Mono Black Discard Control thing. I think that deck is awful in 2022, like it does not have the, you know, it does not have the fighting power to be a serious deck. The reason I think that is because it's missing tools like Eaten Alive. Like if you're playing an Elder Fang Disciple to make your opponent discard a card, a 1-1 one, one for 2 is not a good body. You need a way to leverage that body into a further advantage, like trading it via Eaten Alive for their Lolth, like exiling a Lolth with your bad creature. Um, or, like, you can get in a few hits with Vengeful Strangler, sacrifice it to Eaten Alive to kill the immediate threat with Eaten Alive, and then hit something else of high value next turn with the Strangling Grasp. This, this is a great budget play pattern, like, I'm not necessarily saying it will be competitive, competitive, tier 1 or whatever, but if you want a kind of angle of deck building to investigate that's pretty easy on the wild cards, like, it's a common and an uncommon, this is something I would highlight as worth looking into. Anyway, Slaughter Specialist, just yay, she's a good lady. Um, in particular, the giving them a token thing is not a downside. Full, full stop. If you're playing a card like this versus a control opponent, traditionally it would be dead. Or like just not great. Giving your control opponent the token uh, helps ensure you actually get counters on your creature and be down for four instead of you know, just kind of flapping away at them with a more poorly statted creature. And, uh, yeah, I I know some people are down on this card because it gives them a blocker, but, like, a, a different way to contextualize Slaughter Specialist is in combination with white. Like, your opponent doesn't always have creatures for white to fight. Um, so, if you give them a creature and then cast, like, Blizzard Brawl on your white to kill the human token, you're up a zombie and you have put a counter on Slaughter Specialist. So there are play patterns that Slaughter Specialist enables that I am very... I don't know if optimistic about is the right word, but, like, I've played with Serolf a lot, which is a 3-mana three 3-3 three, three that can kind of get counters on it sometimes if things die, and Serolf is a very good card. Uh, Slaughter Specialist does kind of the same thing, so, yeah. Slaughter Specialist... Th thumbs up? Mm. Like I said, good lady. Ooh! Uh, mono green aggressive self mill things. Uh, Death Bonnet Sprout is, I think, a card people might be sleeping on for a serious construction. Um, in particular, self mill strategies in combination with things like Egon, uh, Egon's, you know, the Throne of Death that also mills a card. The Throne of Death is actually a reasonably good value engine over a game. So having a thing that also kind of pairs with it. Uh, to, and, you know, eventually flips into a 3-mana, or sorry, 1-mana 3-3 three, three that can grow is great. Like, that that's a pairing made in Golgari Heaven. Uh, Willowgeist also just helps ensure Death Bond and Sprout generates value. Um, the plus one, plus one counter thing on Willowgeist is per instance of things leaving the graveyard. 
So if like six things leave the graveyard at once, it only gets one counter. But if only one thing leaves the graveyard at once, it still gets one counter. Uh, Death Bonnet Sprout, if you have like two or three of these on the field and a Willow Geist, all three eat a creature, Willow Geist will get three counters. That's a very like magical Christmas land, best case scenario type of thing. But like, that's a great play pattern with aggressive one ones. Even if these cards are like the um, Pelt Collector. Ha, huh, let's see if I can remember to edit out that pause. Even if these things are the Pelt Collector at home, like Pelt Collector at home is still a better one drop than Green and Golgari has had in a long time. So I'm very optimistic about Willowgeist and Death Bonnet Sprouts roll in mono green and Golgari aggro decks. Uh, another thing I like in those decks too is just old stick fingers. Like old stick fingers helps shove creatures in the graveyard and ensure that Death Bonnet Sprout and Will Guest have material to work with. Um, old stick fingers might have combo potential and stuff. People who are more into that type of deck building than me seem optimistic about it. I personally just like having, you know, a two mana card that can occasionally grow my other, my bad 1-1 one, one into a good, you know, 3-3 three, three and so on. So yeah, I just wanted to outline this as kind of a general package that you might want to keep an eye out on. Oh, the Planeswalkers. So I thought it might be good to review these just because it's been a while since some of them have come out. I don't agree with how people are analyzing some of them, etc, etc. Arlen, I might spend the least time on. She's extremely, extremely good. Um, she presents aggressive decks, a lot of counterplay versus control decks, and is efficiently statted, makes mana, does everything werewolves want to do, even if she doesn't fit in the werewolves kind of deck or package, or like, even if that deck is not great, she can still just be generally useful in a gruel kind of aggressive deck. So yeah, Arlen, thumbs up, very good, probably a card I will play a lot. Um, Ren and Seven, one of the first cards spoiled, there are a lot of ways to build Ren and Seven that are very serious and probably very competitive. Um, yeah, like, the abilities are just good, making a tree folk that can be enormous and block a goldspan dragon, great. Mulching yourself in a set with graveyard synergies, also great. Uh, the zero is something I think a lot of people are going to undervalue. It's Journey for the Oracle, a four mana card on an ability that does not cost you anything, really. I, I might be overly optimistic on it. I have a Jadzi self-mill deck that I released a video on ages and ages ago. Renin 7 does everything that Jadzi deck does, but for like three to four mana cheaper in every respect, and that Jadzi deck could get wins. So, like, there's there's a very kind of linear, I think probably fine way to build Renin 7. I also think Renin 7 can and, like, should be looked at as a serious kind of combo enabler, or like something that can break mana in a very particular and, you know, vaguely scary way. I'm, I'm not saying Ren and Seven will be super busted or anything. Simic options, teamer options, stormy things you can do with Ren and Seven that are not kind of the first thing that springs to mind. Uh, with Teferi Who Slows the Sunset, uh, this is the Teferi I like the most out of the ones that have been released recently, mostly because instead of, you know, being bone grinding control, it's more of a mid-range card. In particular, I think the structural role it will fill, fulfill in a deck is less so of, like, tr Teferi's traditional role of being a core card or, like, a focus of the deck, and more so being a Basri Ket. Um, Basri Ket is... A card I think almost everyone misused while he was in standard. Um, he's a tremendous bullfighting card, like you have to kill this or th uh, the ultimate will win the game for me. I look at this to Perry in a very similar way of like, you have to kill this or I will get two turns every turn. And you can use the plus one and minus two to help manipulate your hand and the board to make that process as costly for the opponent as possible. So I don't know, you even need to look at like the plus one, minus two necessarily as control tools, so much as ways to extract value and like redirect your opponent's attention to Teferi. It's a little bit different from Basri Ket in that the difference between three and four mana for a card like that is a lot, although his plus one kind of offsets that. Uh, that's, that's kind of my general feeling about Teferi at the moment anyway.
Next up, ooh, burn and spell slinging kind of in general have a lot of tools. Um, I think Poppet Stitcher is a card people are generally underrating or kind of not giving not giving its due. It's uh it, importantly, it's a second copy of Sedgemore Witch. One of the big issues with Sedgemore Witch from a deck structure perspective, or like if you're trying to build a really Sedgemore Witch focused deck, is there's only four of them, and if they get killed or whatever. Um, things can really kind of slow down. Poppet Stitcher provides good redundancy on that front. Also, the Poppet Factory effect of just converting the tokens to 3 threes, very good, very strong. You can occasionally, like, plumb the Forbidden on your opponent's end, end step, spit out a bunch of new pests and stuff, uh, if you have, you know, such more Witch out. Um, convert all those pests to 3 threes, use all your new cards to clear the path, swing in for a ton of damage. Play patterns like that, I think, are something that might be might be legit. Mm. Uh, smoldering Egg? The main thing I wanted to point out with Smoldering Egg is that I think the mana cost element, uh, 7 mana to flip the egg into Ashmouth Dragon, is a strength, not a weakness. Burn decks are traditionally limited to using like very cheap, efficient spells. Uh, lightning Bolts, Shocks, etc, etc, it depends on the format. Um, the nice thing about Smoldering Egg is it does let you use bigger spells and still get paid similarly for using them, so you're not kind of as locked in with your burn suite into cards that are not always good versus uh, like a big green deck, Green Stompy for example. So I think Smoldering Egg is kind of important as a different avenue or kind of different angle burn decks will be able to take moving forward, which I'm, I'm here for, I love playing burn. Um, on that burn note, light up the night, we, yay, uh, love a good X spell. It's not quite as good as Perforos's intervention for the purpose of killing creatures, which doubled the mana you put into the X, but it can go face, which is big. Like, this is kind of halfway between Perforos's intervention and Crackle with Power in a really kind of good, productive way. Um, light up the night, lovely card, the flashback, remove X loyalty counters thing. Probably not going to be immediately relevant. I wouldn't be surprised if we got like a Chandra next set that it really works with. But for the moment, I think it's just a good X cost burn spell. Sacred Fire, Tiny Lightning Helix, thumbs up. A uh, Ghost Flame Reservoir. This is very similar to Firemind's Research, the Is It card from Guilds of Ravnica, one of the Ravnicas. Um, the thing I like about Ghost Flame Reservoir in comparison to Firemind's Research, even though it's a mana more expensive, it's less color restrictive overall, which all always nice. Um, and the the burn mode is more flexible. You can kind of hit a target for anything, which helps deal with things in a similar way or like sim similar deck building huh, from a similar deck building perspective as Smoldering Egg. Um, and the the draw mode also just I think better. I don't remember. I, in, in general, I think Ghost Flame's kind of structure as a card it better suits the way Burn specifically wants to work, of like keeping resources flowing, adjusting kind of on a granular level how much damage you're dealing where, kind of all that stuff. I don't know that it will be a key card, but I think it will be important, especially versus control opponents, where uh, like board wipes and stuff that clear out thermo alchemists and things like that can usually be a pretty big issue. It's, yeah, part of why I don't think it will be a key card, sorry, to circle back, is just Prismari Command, Artifact Destruction is kind of kind of an issue, but in best of three anyway, you can sideboard Gust Flame in and out as necessary. Uh, Rem Carlos, kind of an interesting card for Burn, just as a general archetype. I don't think Rem Carlos is like a make or break piece, but he enhances your burn and reduces the effect of the opponent's burn. Uh, reducing the effect of opponent's burn in particular, very relevant versus, is it dragons? Rem Carlos kind of playing mirror breaker in those situations will actually be fairly important or like demand attention in a very particular way. Uh, his protection doesn't work on himself. That's fine. Like if they're killing your Rem Carlos instead of your Thermo Alchemist, you're winning. So yeah, Rem Carlos, good card. I don't know... I don't have a strong opinion personally as to like whether or not Boris Burn, Mono Red Burn, etc. will be the way to build Burn, 
or if it will be even be like a tier one deck or you know competitive deck in general but i i'm optimistic like there's enough pieces we're getting here uh some stuff i'm not showing to like thermo alchemist um that i think burn will have the best shot in standard it's had in a long time um but yeah we'll we'll see how it shakes out Reckless Stormseeker. Ooh, haste. Arnie Brokenbrow. The Arnie. No, Arnie Brokenbrow is the Arnie Brokenbrow at home now. Uh, three mana, plus one, plus oh, and haste until end of turn. Target creature. Um, so it can haste itself in on its first turn and then haste another creature in on turn four. Like, say, a Moonveal Regent. Um, or, you know, maybe a Florian, so the Florian can hit them and get in some extra damage to dig deeper for new cards. I think, like, Reckless Stormseeker is a very important aggro card. Uh, if you're interested in Mono Red aggro, you can craft four of this immediately. Like, this is one of the few cards in the video I will immediately just, like, mm, thumbs up. Craft four of, it's great. Arnie Brokenbrow was the best part of 2022, like, non-goblins Mono Red aggro. And the, like, sh fall off from there was real steep. There's some other parts to the package, too. Um, the two one for one the vampire and stuff. Some other random creatures that will help flesh that out. Even if we don't get, like, clean mono-red aggro back in standard with Innistrad, um, Reckless Stormseeker is going to be a huge and important part of either, the, like, uh, Rakdos aggro, Gruul aggro. It is a human werewolf, which is excellent typing. If humans are in Naya at all, you'll want a Reckless Stormseeker. I don't think they will be, but... Mm. Uh, Florian, I... People seem to be hip to this card, like, just deal damage, draw cards. He's good. Um, Moonvale Regent, yeah, I, I'm also high on this card. I, I've sort of talked about them as I was covering this. I don't think you need to worry about, like, your colors, Basically, it's just really good for card advantage. Like, it's a dragon that draws you more cards and deals damage when it dies. In particular, I like that its damage when it dies clause is way less restrictive than Leyline Tyrant. Like, you don't have to float mana and set it up, it just happens. There will occasionally just be situations where, like, pinging something for one is great. You can maybe use it in combination with burn or something to get a kill you that you wouldn't have otherwise had access to. Um, yeah, Moonvale Region, good card. Ooh, random removal suite stuff. Yeah, so I just kind of wanted to go card by card here and talk about kind of some applications I think people might be over or underrating. Mostly underrating. I think a lot of the removal we're getting is amazing. Uh, Bloodline Culling, minus five, minus five, until end of turn kills any indestructible creature in standard. Um, in particular, it hits Arlen. So, if you're having problems with Gruul Werewolves in the upcoming Innistrad, get yourself some Bloodline Cullings, even though that deck does not uh, run, like, generate a lot of tokens, aside from maybe if that 6-mana Huntmaster or whatever is good. Um, Arlen does generate tokens, too. So, yeah, the, the reason Bloodline Culling, like, really is just a hard answer to Arlen, the 5-5 five five gets Arlen herself if she's in the wolf mode, the minus 2-2 two minus two takes care of wolf tokens. Uh, it is a just wonderful, wonderful bit of tech, bit of removal. Uh, also useful, too, versus zombies and stuff, like if that poppet lit stitcher line from earlier I mentioned is a thing, you can bloodline culling at instant speed before they flip over into three threes. Uh, yeah, bloodline culling. There are worlds where this is not immediately, like, great removal, depending on how the meta shakes out, but remember that it exists. It's really good. Uh, foul play. Foul play is a wonderful tool for something that has had no room to thrive in 2022, which is to say, like, mid-range, value-y, grindy decks that aren't just blood on the snow loops. Um, spot removal in particular, or spot removal that draws a card in particular, is something that uh, mid-range decks really like. Um, that type of card advantage has a great home in Golgari midrange. I mostly wanted to highlight this as like a best of three card versus mono white aggro, even mono green aggro, maybe humans. Um, it's an option to flesh out your removal suite in kind of black. Meat Hook Massacre, the Bastion of Remembrance effect, staple to a wrath. It's not quite the Bastion of Remembrance effect, but 
just as a wrath, I think this is very good. Um, in particular, I think people are underrating just how good, like, minus one, minus one, minus two, minus two, etc. will be. Uh, even in creature decks, like, if you're playing Golgari, you will often win creature sizing matchups. Uh, so you can do this, like, pre-combat even. Your creatures will shrink, but you'll still get in it, you'll clear the way, like, of all their dumb little tokens or whatever. Still get in for some damage, um, the kind of bastion or the, the drain modes on it help kind of offset the fact you've sh shrunk your own creatures. L lovely card, very good wrath. Fateful Absence, best removal in white in standard for years. Craft four of this, it can go in basically any white deck. It's a way for those decks to take out like Kaya, Lolf, wh whoever, whatever is kind of the big spooky thing uh, at instant speed, which white has not had, I think, any access to in recent standards. White's been very sorcery speed. Uh, Vanquish the Horde, I think, will be better than people expect in the new meta, or like in Innistrad meta. Um, in particular, I know there's talk about how, like, just play Doomscar or whatever. But if your opponent is going really wide, uh, and you can vanquish the horde for, you know, two mana, three mana, without having to spend mana on the foretell, it's just, like, mwah, chef's kiss, amazing. Um, it's probably going to be more of a best of three card, I mostly play best of three when, you know, we have a best of three queue to play in. Hey wizards, cool, cool 2022 decision. Uh, uh, but yeah, um, Vanquish the Horde, I don't think Doomscar is strictly better. I think in best of three it has some room to shine as just hyper-efficient wrath versus go-wide strategies, whether that's like the current mono-white or some Poppet Stitch or Sedgemore Witch thing. Uh, yeah, just card, card two, keep in mind. Ooh, Slow Selesnia. Um, so in particular, or like I, I won't spend as much time as I have talking about individual cards here, I think Celestia is getting a lot of tools to grind out like a good, just really solid mid rangey control y mid rangey game. Um, Augur of Autumn, in particular, excellent value generator. Like, Augur of Autumn can single handedly define how a deck works. Um, Sun Gold Sentinel, too, could be very important depending on how, how much people are relying on disturb cards in their graveyard in general. Uh, Sunset Revelry is a excellent kind of control, or like mid-range control card. Adeline, wonderful token generation versus control. There's a lot of tools here for a mid-range Celesnia deck. Um, Consuming Blob's creature generation, also great. Uh, that type of deck hasn't really had room to thrive in the 2022 meta, partly because of creature selection, partly because best of one hyper-polarizes in general like aggro or control. I think in best of three, it will be a really kind of rich, rich vein to mine. Um, you know, just, it's oozing with value. Oozing with value. So yeah, Selesnia midrange. I don't know if it will be human specifically, there might be some other stuff to work in. Pack leader, uh, werewolf pack leader is actually a human on his front side too, which is a good thing to keep in mind for Selesnia. For humans, just, you know, stuff in general. Uh, lots, lots of stuff to work with there. Ooh, random cards? Random cards. We'll, we'll get to those in a second. Um, so the human package in general, I think will probably just be in Selesnia. I don't know that there's enough support in other cards for it. I do think Jaren Corrupted Bishop is very good. Um, the Abzan Splash in general might not be worth it. I think that will kind of depend on, like, if Infernal Grasp or other humans in black end up being kind of an interesting way to build it. Uh, creeping in... It's not so much that I think Creeping in is an excellent card in itself more, that I think it's a very low-cost include. I think it beats out not all man lands, but, like, in decks that want to grind out games. Uh, if if there's like an Abzan Humans deck that wants to go long, I think Creeping In will fit in there, or like Orzhov maybe. Um, I think it's just a generally low cost include in Sacrifice decks. Rite of Harmony, this card's busted. Woo! 
keep it in mind for your human stacks with Catilda. Uh, she is the Dawn Heart Coven. The, the mana generation in combination with the Rite of Harmony in particular is a really compelling resource engine for any type of human stack. I don't know if, like, Tokens Humans will be the best build or one that leans on Sun Gold Sentinel and, like, Adeline and other actual cards will be better. Either way, like, any way you slice it, I think Catilda, Rite of Harmony, is an important resource engine to keep in mind. Unnatural Growth might seem like a weird thing to include on the kind of human sacrifice, etc. slide. Um, I think people analyze Unnatural Growth and cards like it incorrectly a lot of the time. You don't really want to double up your green stompy creatures, but going from 4-4 to 8-8 doesn't meaningfully change your damage clock on an opponent, like it gives them opportunity to respond with the removal. Um, converting 2-2s into 4-4s go, means you go from a 10-turn clock to a 5-turn clock, like the power increase is more relevant lower down on the scale, it helps those creatures like beat other creatures in combat much more consistently. I think Unnatural Growth's home will be in a cre uh, deck with smaller creatures than most people might expect. Um, not necessarily humans, but like if you're looking at a competitive use for natural growth, I would not look at huge, huge green creatures. Maybe keep your curve lower, use Unnatural Growth as a kind of curve topper. I think that's going to be more of where its home is if it does have a competitive home in the format. Sigarda, Champion of Light, I, nah, she's fine. Uh, Amiria's Call, your human stack can have, like, good flyover potential. Sigarda's fine. Oh, trap cards. Uh, this is the part of the video people will yell at me about. So these are the cards that I think people value really highly that are not good. Uh, Sunstreak Phoenix, people always love the Phoenixes, they want to reclaim the glory days of Arclight Phoenix and stuff. Uh, having to pay two for this effect is real rough. Like, it, um, it really slows down the advantage engine, or like the just general value of sticking a Sunstreak Phoenix, a Sunstreak Phoenix in the bin. The fact that it also doesn't have haste is just bad. <laughs> Um, there is Ebon Death, who does Sunstreak Phoenix's job better, quite frankly, like, now I, I just wish they would give us a re Rekindling Phoenix, like, oh, g g give me a good Rekindling Phoenix, that was, that, th those were good times. Th th mm. Anyway, uh, Enduring Angel flips over into Angelic Enforcer, uh, I'm almost certainly going to die to this card, I still don't think this card is good. Uh, just in particular, the game plan of, like, get yourself to three life and then flip it and do crazy game-winning stuff. Not generally a good game plan. It, it, aggro just runs over it if your opponent holds up, like, a frostbite and Enduring Angel dies. Ooh, you have lost the game, so. Yeah, Enduring Angel is just, like, the, the play pattern is fundamentally not great, even if the card is really strong or, like, does really strong things. Don't, don't. Just please don't. Uh, Storm of the Festival, the, the Coco, but big. Um, one of the reasons Storm of the Festival is worse than it looks is that, aside from not digging as deep, is Collected Company. The Coco effect at higher mana values is actually not as good. Like, if you can get two five drops off of Storm of the Festival, then great, you're, you're doing it. You're doing big Coco. But the problem is that dex mana curves can't support tons of 5-drops, which means you're probably hitting, like, a 5-drop and a 2-drop, a 4-drop and a 1-drop, uh, so on, so on. Um, and that makes the effect in general way less compelling. The fact that sorcery speed also makes interacting with it easier in general. It might be able to get there just off of the, like, flashback effect or something if there's a green deck that really wants to go long. But I wouldn't, this is a card that I think reads kind of exciting and is just not as, you know, overall good as you might want it to be. And we're done. Yeah, so I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you've stuck with the me this long, hey, thanks. Glad you liked it, maybe, or are angrily shouting at me about the Phoenix, who knows. Uh, anyway, if you did like the video, consider subscribing, supporting the channel, clicking on links, etc genuinely helps.
Uh, and yeah, hope you have a wonderful life. Bye-bye.